Most foods are characterized as either good or bad for various reasons. Uh, but my point here in this video is there's a lot of foods that are called so-called bad foods that are actually pretty good for you if you look at the real research behind all this. The first one I want to talk about, or the first food, it's a food that I've mentioned in previous, several previous videos, and I'm talking about whole eggs. Uh, bodybuilders have had long have a habit of, uh, of uh, or a tradition, I should say, of uh, consuming only egg whites, which as soon as I st started studying nutrition many, many years ago, I realized the folly of that, how stupid it is to consume only egg whites. There's no real actual scientific reason to do it. Theoretically, bodybuilders uh, uh, throw out the yolks because the yolks contain the fat and, the, and it contains, uh, you know, fat is the, uh, can, uh, fat contains a dense source of calories at nine per gram. And the idea is that if you uh, throw out the yolks, uh, you're eating egg whites, which are pure protein. But what they fail to understand is that almost all the nutrients found in eggs are in the egg yolks. Recent studies show that have compared, or I should say, have, that have compared consuming whole eggs to uh, to just um, egg whites have shown that whole eggs produce far greater benefits as far as building muscle. And again, this is because the, the amino acid content of, of eggs is based on the combination of the amino acids found in the yolk and the egg white. The egg white does not contain the ideal proportion of amino acids like people think. You have to have both the yolk and the and the egg white to get the really high quality protein that eggs are famous for. Uh, and I, one, one of the reasons why health authorities have discouraged people uh, from eating eggs is the idea that eggs are high in cholesterol. And it's true, an egg contains about 300 milligrams of cholesterol, which is coincidentally uh, the amount that the American Heart Association says that you should eat, eat no more than 300 milligrams a day of cholesterol. Uh, and, but it seems like when you eat high cholesterol foods like eggs, what happens is your liver, uh, your, your cholesterol is made in the body, in the liver. Cholesterol is, uh, a lot of people overlook the fact that cholesterol is an essential element. It's needed for the formation of cell membranes. Uh, cholesterol forms the raw material for steroid hormones such as testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, uh, you name it, DHEA. All these come from the cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol is also the raw material in the skin, which is converted into uh, activated vitamin D upon exposure to UV light. So your body will make cholesterol. It makes about one or two grams a day, about a gram a day. And what happens is when you eat food cholesterol, such as that found in eggs, your liver simply cuts the production of cholesterol down. It kind of balances out. A lot of people overlook that. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the studies where they've looked at people who eat whole eggs, They've noticed that uh, even people that eat a fairly good amount of uh, whole eggs, the cholesterol levels still remain stable. There was one case, all right, there was a single case study, and that's kind of anecdotal, but still, one case study of an older man who was eating 25 whole eggs a day for something like 20 years, and he had normal cholesterol and blood lipid levels. Didn't affect him. He had no signs of heart disease, nothing. Okay, he's one person. You can't say that applies to everyone. But it's interesting because if the health authorities were correct, this guy should have been dead years ago of, of a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, the reason why the cholesterol in eggs is not that bad is very simple. You have uh, two classes, uh, well, there's several actually, but I'm going to talk about two classes of what they call lipoproteins. These are proteins manufactured in the liver that deal with the transport and usage of cholesterol in the body. One of them is called high-density lipoprotein. High-density lipoprotein functions to remove cholesterol from the blood, carry it back to the, uh, the liver, where the cholesterol is converted into bile and then eventually excreted as bile salts. Uh, this is the only way the body can get rid of cholesterol because it can, can't be burned like fat can. It's the only way the body can dispose of it. The other kind is also often called the bad cholesterol, which is low-density lipoprotein. But it turns out there's different kinds of low-density lipoprotein. The small, dense type of lipoprotein, which is increased by carbohydrate content of the diet, not fat, or the carbohydrate content of the diet, small, dense, uh, low-density lipoprotein uh, is uh, greatly more prone to oxidation. And only oxidized LDL is dangerous. Oxidized LDL does have a relation to the onset of cardiovascular disease. When you eat eggs, the other type of LDL is produced, which is a large, fluffy form. Uh, the large fluffy form of LDL is not prone to oxidation or less prone to oxidation and far less prone to causing heart disease. 
Now, at the same time that the, you're, uh, when you eat these whole eggs, at the same time that you're favoring the uh, large fluffy LDL, you're also favoring the production of increased HDL, high density lipoprotein, which in, which in turn will offset any of the effect, any of the bad effect of, of LDL. So it kind of balances out, and this explains why eggs uh, don't really, uh, they don't really cause heart disease. That's a myth. Uh, egg intake has been shown to promote, as I said, the formation of large LDL. In a 12-week study published in the journal Metabolism in 2013, and people who had the, what they call the metabolic syndrome. The metabolic syndrome is a constellation of several symptoms, such as a wider or waist, uh, elevated blood glucose levels, ele elevated blood lipids like cholesterol and triglycerides, uh, elevated glucose levels. All of them combine to form what they call the metabolic syndrome, which is a forerunner for uh, both cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Anyway, uh, this study, this 12-week study published in the journal Metabolism in 2013, looked at a group of people with a metabolic syndrome, and uh, one group consumed whole eggs, the other group didn't. The group that consumed whole eggs experienced greater improvements in heart health markers than the egg, than the egg white group. I should say it wasn't the other group ate egg, only egg whites, not whole eggs. The people that ate the whole eggs showed more improvement in markers of cardiovascular health than the people who ate only egg whites. The people who ate the egg, uh, whole eggs also had greater reductions in insulin levels and, insulin res and lower insulin resistance. Egg yolks are also high in, in two uh, key nutrients for the eye, eye health called lutein and, and, and zeaxanthin. Both of these are known to uh, not only maintain eye health, but they also prevent a serious disorder of the eye that affects a lot of older people called macular degeneration, which is the number one cause of blindness in older people. And uh, having a, 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 a good storage of, uh, let's say, lutein in the eye uh, and zeaxanthin will also help to uh, prevent cataracts. Cataracts are caused by oxidation uh, in the protein that forms the lens of the eye. And uh, since uh, lutein and zeaxanthin uh, have antioxidant activity, they will help prevent cataracts and macular degeneration. In addition, recent studies show that lutein uh, seems to uh, increase brain health and increases cognition. It seems to have a very powerful brain protective uh, function that was recently discovered. And an interesting thing about lutein, lutein is found in a number of vegetables and other foods, but what the studies have shown is that the type of lutein found in egg yolks is the most absorbable form available. Again, the lutein in egg yolks is the most uh, the most absorbable form known to mankind, and, and all these people are throwing away egg yolks. So don't believe the crap about it. I wouldn't go crazy on eggs. In other words, you don't want to eat like three dozen eggs a day. That's asking for trouble. I mean, that, that'll the calories enough is going to create problems. But you should also know, as I've said in past videos, eggs aren't that high in saturated fat. They contain a, a greater preponderance of a monounsaturated fat. That's the same type of fat that's found in virgin, extra virgin olive oil and, and uh, certain types of nuts. Uh, the, the important point is monounsaturated fat in active people it tends to burn very fast. It tends to, When you're active, it tends to be oxidized. It doesn't stick in the body as body fat. So that's another reason why it's stupid to throw out egg yolks because of fear of the fat. Dumb. Another food that's often stigmatized is coconut oil. Coconut oil gets a lot of publicity lately. It's, uh, some people consider it a health food. It, uh, the, the reason why coconut oil is thought to be bad is because it's high in saturated fat. However, coconut oil raises, again, it raises protective HDL more than it raises LDL. Because saturated fat, the bad thing about saturated fat, it's known to raise LDL levels. But when you, have, uh, when you ingest coconut oil, it raises HDL, and it does raise HDL, LDL, but the HDL is far greater effect than the, than the effect on LDL. Also, uh, coconut oil contains medium chain triglycerides, which uh, are uh, very rapidly oxidized, very unlikely to become body fat, and they're also less likely to be stored as body fat. This has been known for many, many years. Medium chain triglycerides also reduce appetite and promote feelings of fullness. Uh, again, um, some recent uh, studies or observations coconut oil, M or because of its MCT content, MCTs have a uh, uh, strong tensity, tendency to be converted into ketones, which are byproducts of fat metabolism, which can be used in, as an alternative fuel in the body, especially the brain. And a couple of people have found that uh, giving, uh, let's say, coconut oil or MCT oil 
to people in the early stages of dementia, such as Alzheimer's, uh, it actually increases their cognition where they almost seem like they're back to normal. In other words, it, it greatly helps it. And the reason for that is that because people who are in the early stages of dementia have problems using glucose, which is normally the primary fuel for the brain. Uh, that's as a problem where they can't use glucose properly. However, they can use ketones. So when you supply ketones to these people with early stage dementia, it's the, the, the brain is now getting a, a fuel that it can use and it starts to work better. It's kind of like using a better grade of gasoline in your car. One study published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 1996 looked at 80 healthy young men who were, t who were ingesting 50 to 30 grams of medium chain triglycerides that's about the amount you found in two to three tablespoons a day of uh, coconut oil, and and it, and it appeared increased the, it appeared to increase the number of calories they burned each day by an average of 120 calories a day. That suggests an increased metabolic effect. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to the next uh, uh, often uh, demonized food. That would be full fat dairy products like cheese, butter, and cream. They are rich in saturated fat. And they are, uh, you know, they do contain cholesterol, but of, of all of them, only butter is known to uh, raise uh, LDL cholesterol. <clears throat> so there's nothing wrong with butter, but you want to use it in very moderate amounts, very moderate. Uh, if I use butter, I use maybe one pat. That's it. I don't use any more than that. You want to go easy on the uh, on the butter, you know, because it does raise HDL cholesterol. But only full-fat dairy products contain vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 helps to protect the heart and bone health by keeping calcium out of, uh, in your bones and out of your arteries. K2 is very important. If you're uh, uh, anyone who's taking uh, uh, vitamin D, should also be taking uh, K2 because the vitamin D promotes calcium entry into the body, not in a dangerous way. But if you're taking really high doses of D, there's a slight chance you might the D might uh, increase uh, the, the calcium uptake into tissues other than bone causing a calcification effect, uh, vitamin K will prevent that. So if again, high dose vitamin D you should always be taking vitamin K also, K2 I should say. There's different forms of vitamin K. K1, that's the one found in the vegetables. That helps, is involved in the blood clotting process, but it does not affect this, um, this uh, moderation of calcium use in the body. That's only found with K2, K7, those type of things, those types of uh, vitamin K. Full-fat dairy products also contain con con conjugated linoleic acid, which is actually a natural trans fat. Normally, trans fats are kind of Frankenstein fats, where um, where, hydro where uh, hydrogen atoms have a been added to a fat to make it more stable. Uh, they're very bad for you. Tran uh, trans fats are probably one of the worst fat you can eat. However, conjugated lino lino linoleic acid, or CLA, is an exception to the rule because it has many possible health benefits. Uh, one review of several studies found that CLA supplements may help promote fat loss, but that's kind of paradoxical. Some study it seems to work better in animals, and the dose of CLA CLA they give to animals is usually like three or four times greater than ever given to humans. Uh, but there's been a couple, one or two, a couple of studies showing that CLA may help uh, um, uh, help you lose body fat. Uh, a, a couple of studies also show that uh, it helps to increase uh, muscle strength when you're working out. Again, these aren't that great. I wouldn't count on a CLA for that. However, legumes, legumes like beans and certain nuts, they're considered pretty bad. I mean, there's been uh, there's been uh, uh, there's a thing about uh, what is it called lectins. Uh, there's a couple of, of uh, so-called health experts telling people to avoid lectins because they destroy your intestine, this and that. And legumes are high in, in peanuts and all that. It's a bunch of crap to tell you the truth. A certain amount of the, the, the lectins in smaller amounts are harmless. Uh, in fact, some uh, some lectins actually have be uh, health benefits. Uh, so uh, legumes include beans, like I say, lentils, peas, and peanuts. Uh, now another problem with some of these uh, legumes are they contain phytates. Phytates are what they call anti-nutrients that kind of lock onto uh, other nutrients, like for example, uh, certain minerals. And they kind of lock onto them and cause them to be excreted out of the body. Uh, you know, as long as you're eating other foods uh, that contain these minerals, for example, phytates will like on, will like onto uh, zinc and iron. Uh, and uh, as long as you're eating foods, for example, red meat, which is high in both zinc and iron, 
you don't have to worry about that. This would only be a factor if you're not eating foods or taking supplements that contain zinc and iron. So it's nothing to really worry about. Legumes are also rich in potassium, really good source of potassium, magnesium, good source of magnesium, and other minerals. Several studies have found that they reduce inflammation, decrease blood sugar, and promote heart health. Uh, legumes, uh, some of the legumes tend to contain soluble uh, fiber, which uh, actually, uh, if you take, uh, if you just soluble fiber with a highly refined carbohydrate, it'll slow down the absorption of the carbohydrate and prevent an insulin rush, thereby making the refined carbon less less likely to produce body fat and less likely to cause blood glucose aberrations. As I said, beans are an excellent source of fiber, especially the soluble fiber that does that. Studies suggest that soluble fiber may also reduce appetite, promote fullness, and decrease calcium, uh, I'm sorry, calorie absorption for meals. In fact, they did a study, a recent study showed that peanuts, uh, peanuts are pretty high in fat. They're like 79% fat. It's, again, almost all monounsaturated fat. There's no cholesterol in peanuts. Uh, people have always avoided peanuts because of the fat content. But a recent study showed that uh, as much as 50% of the peanuts you eat uh, just literally pass right through you. I mean, they're not, they're not digested. It doesn't cause any problems, but what it means is you're not absorbing the calories. So peanuts are not nearly as uh, fattening as people think. I actually keep a jar of peanuts in, uh, around here. At night, sometimes I get really hungry, and rather than eat junk food, like, you know, refined carbohydrates, some crappy food that'll tend to put fat on me, I'll reach for a handful of peanuts, and maybe it's because of the fat content, I'm not sure, because peanuts are also high in protein, but doing that seems to assuage my appetite and prevent me from eating bad foods. And it also keeps my blood glu uh, glucose more stable because peanuts don't raise your blood glucose level. Uh, another highly criticized food, I mean, uh, this is a big controversy, is red meat or meat in general. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, some studies come out. I mean, the thing about meat is really confusing. Because one study will come out exonerating meat, saying it doesn't cause any problems. Then three days later, another study comes out, says that red meat is associated with the onset of colon cancer. So, you know, you, you don't know what to believe. Every, every, every week, one study contradicts the next. But let me make it easy for you. Uh, the truth of the matter is fresh red meat uh, in moderate amounts is, does not cause colon cancer. Colon cancer, I should say. Col colon cancer. What the hell is colon cancer? Anyway, anyway, but it, it, fresh red meat in moderate amounts, uh, uh, you know, does not cause uh, colon cancer. Um, uh, it, meat, meat itself, uh, the, the, if anything uh, is associated with colon cancer, it would be the processed meats, like the processed deli meats, the hot dogs, that kind of stuff. That stuff has a, a, a somewhat of an association with causing um, or promoting colon cancer. Not fresh meat. Uh, meat itself is a good source of some nutrients. It's a, it contains the best form of iron found in nature, heme iron, the most absorbable. Women tend to avoid meat, and a lot of women have iron deficiency anemia. If they ate a little bit of meat uh, a couple of times a week, they would not have any anemia at all because the heme iron found in meat is very absorbed. Uh, the only other problem I see with meat is, uh, well, two actually, overcooked meat, uh, br you know, excessively burned meat. They contain stuff like heterocyclic amines, they're called. Uh, if you uh, consume these, these are carcinogens. So if you, you know, if you, if you cook meat to death or you barbecue it where, you know, the fat drips down, that fat, you know, comes back, uh, you know, kind of fumes go back into the meat. And uh, these fumes, unfortunately, contain these, these, um, these amines, which are carcinogens. Uh, so that type of meat is dangerous. Overcooked meat is dangerous. The other type of thing I would say is uh, I still believe that even though I don't think meat is that bad for you, uh, speaking for myself, <laughs> I always had a problem eating meat, not because of any health reason, because I'm a kind of an animal activist. And uh, I did an article a couple of years ago for a bodybuilding magazine about, uh, I was asked to do an article on uh, what they call uh, uh, grass-fed beef, which I wasn't familiar with at the time, but as the name implies, this is a uh, Kind of a more natural beef where the, the the animals aren't herded together and blah 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 grass-fed beef contains much higher amounts of certain it has a better balance of fat it actually contains some omega-3 fat and thus it contains much more cla than than the regular type of meat however in doing this uh, research for this article i was just absolutely startled to see how cows 
are treated on these so-called factory farms, and it disgusted me. It turned my stomach. At the time, I was an avid eater of uh, red meat. I, I would eat it in the form of hamburger and occasional steaks, but I was so... I was so shocked when I saw the documentation about how factory farm animals are treated that I stopped eating red meat for a year. I just could not. Every time I'd look at a package of hamburger in a supermarket, my I would, stomach would literally turn. I think of those poor cows. I started eating meat a little bit after that, but I never ate as much as I did before. Prior to doing that article, I was averaging about a pound a day of of, uh, of uh, hamburger, lean lean sirloin. After that, I never ate that much. After that, when I eat when I eat red meat, I I I'd cook the red meat and give about three quarters of it to my dogs who lapped it up. <laughs> they love red meat, so the amount of red meat I was eating was about the equivalent of about a about a, 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 a meatball, and that went on for years. And then I got diverticulitis. I was in the hospital. I lost twenty eight pounds in fourteen days, and and uh, I had nothing to do in the hospital. I had my phone with me, so I researched diverticulitis, and I found that a minor uh, risk factor was red meat. And even though I wasn't eating red meat, it gave me an excuse to cut out red meat, which I'd wanted to do for a long time anyway, because of the ethical factor. In other words, I don't like eating animals. And uh, this was to, uh, a little over two years ago. I have not had any red meat since then. That's just me. And again, I want to emphasize, I didn't cut out red meat for, uh, for any real health reason. Uh, it's a risk factor, but a very slight risk factor for diverticular disease, diverticulitis, I should say. I cut it out because of the uh, ethical factor related to animals. But, you know, that's that's a personal choice. Uh, but my, 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 my point that I'm trying to make here is that small amounts of red meat are, uh, are, are fairly healthy. They have a good, a good amount of nutrients, very bioabsorbable zinc and iron. Uh, there was a famous bodybuilder years ago, uh, tremendous physique, this guy, Serge Bray, his name was. He was from France. He was a pathological liar, but besides, uh, uh, to give you an example, uh, he, uh, he used to tell people he ate anywhere from 9 to 12 pounds of horse meat a day. I don't know if it's still popular, but at that time, horse meat was a popular staple in France when Dubray lived. Uh, and, you know, I look at this guy. He said that uh, he used to say horse meat is almost like eating fish. It's very lean. It hardly has any fat. But the truth of the matter is, if you, don't go by my word. Do a Google search of Serge Dubray. Look at this man's physique. He had a tiny waist. He had that rare look of having deep abdominals and a small waist. Usually I have one or the other. Usually I have a very small waist and weak abs or great abs and a wide waist. This guy had thick abs and a tiny waist. And I say there's no way this guy was eating nine pounds of horse meat a day in addition to other foods because he would never have looked like that. Remember, this is what he said that he consumed prior to a contest. And he said other things that were lies. I'm not going to go into it because this, this video is not about Serge Gebre. I'll, I'll just say he was a great bodybuilder, but not the most honest person in the world. Another, another food that's often said to be bad, which, still, which amazes me, you know, considering the amount of research on it, is coffee. Coffee is almost a health food. It's so good for you. So they think, some people think coffee is bad for health, probably maybe because of the caffeine. I'm not sure. But coffee contains a, a protective nutrients called polyphenols, which have tremendous health benefits. Among the effects is uh, if you drink something like three to four cups of coffee a day, it reduces the risk of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, by 43%. It reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease by about the same percentage. It reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease, reduces the risk of Parkinson's disease, and, and, it, uh, and, it, and it also, um, uh, it, it, it's very good for your brain. It's very brain protective. Uh, there's uh, uh, a substance, one of the polyphenols in there called chlorogenic acid, uh, actually helps to uh, control the blood sugar as well, almost as well as medications do. And chlorogenic acid is a favorite food of the intestinal microbiome, the population of bacteria that live in the intestine. It's very, very good for you. Uh, so, um, and of course, the caffeine content. All right, caffeine's a stimulant, but it can be used to advantage. There's a reason why every pre-workout supplement, the main ingredient in every one of these is caffeine. There's a reason for that because caffeine is a brain stimulant. It, it wakes you up and increases your focus, and it makes you train hard. It helps you train harder. Now it's true. Twenty percent of the population can't handle caffeine. Uh, you know, they get extreme nerve anxiety. They get jitters. You know, they they get heart palpitations. Whatever. 
It turns out these people are what they call slow metabolizers of caffeine. They didn't know this until about four years ago. Due to gene certain genetic, what they call genetic polymorphisms, these people metabolize uh, uh, caffeine in the liver much slower than other people. So when they drink coffee, instead of being fairly rapidly broken down in the liver, it tends to accumulate. And because of that, they get kind of semi-toxic effects from caffeine. So you know if you're one of those people, you don't have to have a test done. If you drink one cup of coffee and you're already feeling lousy, like jittery and nervous, then you're one of those people and you probably should avoid coffee. Or you can have, of course, caffeine-free coffee, uh, decaf as they call it. You know, then in that situation, you get all the benefits of coffee, meaning the polyphenols, without the caffeine. And another antidote is to simply uh, take the... Um, amino acid uh, that's found in green tea naturally, it's sold in supplement form called theanine. Uh, if you take, uh, let's say, anywhere from uh, uh, 100 to 300 milligrams of uh, theanine with coffee, it'll completely offset the stimulation effects of the coffee. In other words, it's not going to make you feel tired, but it, it, it completely takes the edge of coffee. In fact, the combination of, uh, of uh, caffeine and theanine is considered the most basic smart nutrient combination. In other words, if you take that, the caffeine will stimulate your brain, stimulate your focus, stimulate your concentration, but the theanine will take the edge off the caffeine so it doesn't overstimulate. So, you know, don't believe the crap that coffee's bad. It's very good. I myself, I take about four cups a day. That's the recommended maximum amount. I've taken more than that at times. I don't have any problem with caffeine unless I have more than eight cups, which I almost never do. Uh, and also, as a coffee also offers some liver protection, and it slows the prog uh, the progression of hepatitis C. Hepatitis C uh, can lead to what they call uh, liver cirrhosis, which is scar tissue formation in the liver, and the uh, the liver cirrhosis in turn can uh, result in liver cancer. And it's good to know that coffee slows the progression of hepatitis C. They do now have drugs that will cure hepatitis C. Uh, however, I know, I know a couple of people that had hepatitis for year for years they didn't know it and unfortunately they do have cirrhosis of the liver which is a terrible thing um, canned and frozen vegetables are often considered you know inferior to fresh uh, you know there's an advantage there's I mean everybody wants to eat fresh food but the truth of the matter is the um, the, the freezing process uh, does not contrary to popular belief destroy the nutrients uh, in, uh, in in various fruits and vegetables as a matter of fact uh, there's been at least two or three studies showing that frozen blueberries contain more natural antioxidants, uh, anthrocyanidins they're called, than, than the fresh blueberries. Why? Because these uh, antioxidants found in the blueberries are very prone to oxidation when exposed out, you know, even when they're packaged and sent to a market ship. By the time that they get to market, a lot of the antioxidant content is already gone. Whereas the, uh, with the frozen blueberries, it's... Psh, it's frozen. It's literally, you you know, it, it's 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 uh, stabilized if you can call it that. So you're getting actually all the new all the antioxidants. The only blueberries I consume are frozen. I, I get big. I get bags of them at Costco. It's fairly uh, inexpensive. I throw them in a protein drink. Uh, blueberries uh, are extremely good for the brain. Uh, there, there's been studies showing it with animals. Where it revert, they, they've given uh, blueberries to the equivalent of 60-year-old uh, rats. Uh, well, rats don't live that long, but they, let's say the rats were the equivalent uh, to 60-year-old humans. And when they give them blueberries, their brains revert back to a teenage level. So it'd be the equivalent of giving a 60-year-old human uh, blueberries where their brain reverts from a, a being a 60-year-old brain to a 19-year-old brain. <laughs> now you know why I eat blueberries. <laughs> Another thing that's really been criticized, um, uh, you might have heard of, what's the name of that book? Wheat Belly. Uh, this this cardiologist wrote a book called Wheat Belly, where he blamed just about every disease of civilization on on, on wheat products, uh, particularly gluten. Uh, you know, now, I, I hasten to add, let me, if you don't already know this, let me tell you, having a, a, a medical specialty in one thing does not confer expertise in other areas. Just because the guy's a cardiologist does not make him a nutrition expert. Now, in his book, Wheat Belly, he, he did reference a number of studies, but what he did is he cherry-picked. In other words, he, he referenced certain studies that supported his argument while ignoring other studies that found no ill effects of eating either gluten or whole wheat products. Whole wheat products contain a good source of fiber. They contain uh, various nutrients. Uh, 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 oats, for example, which is a form of whole grain, it contains a, a fiber called beta-glucan, 
which is a, a viscous fiber. It, it, it aids weight loss, reduces appetite, and promotes feelings of fullness. Also, increases immune uh, immune power. Uh, as I'm writing this, we're in the midst. I mean, as I'm talking now, we're in the midst of a uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, this uh, coronavirus pandemic, and uh, beta glucan would actually be a very good uh, substance to consume because it definitely increases. Uh, it, it basically, uh, uh, what should I say, it nourishes your immune response. So, uh, you know, don't believe the crap. I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I, as far as the gluten controversy, I, I'm going to write an article about that in my Applied Metabolic, the, um, my Applied Metabolic Newsletter and go into a lot of detail. But suffice to stay, say that I believe that there are certain people that do, I do have a problem. W without a doubt, celiac patients, uh, which is a genetic disease, they can't handle any amount of gluten. There's no doubt about that. But as far as as far as everyone else, I think there's a very small percentage of patients who really do, patients, people who do have uh, a little bit of a problem handling gluten. But for the majority of people, it's all in their minds. Uh, they, they, you know, this, this idea that gluten causes all kinds of problems has, uh, has, has uh, engendered this cottage industry making billions of dollars selling gluten-free foods, which are like four or five times the price of normal foods. But for most people, they offer no advantage at all. When they've uh, done studies where they've tested people who claim they had gluten uh, uh, insensitivity, it turned out that not a single one of them had gluten insensitivity, none of them. There is certain food, there, there, there are certain types of carbohydrates and this is the people I'm talking about who do show sensitivity. Some of these uh, whole wheat grain or whole grain products uh, and, and fruits and vegetables do contain uh, these elements called food maps, which are, that's what it's called, food maps. The, these are types of carbohydrate, oligosaccharides, others that are a little bit hard to digest for, some, uh, for a lot of people. And when they eat a large amount of these foods, they do get symptoms that look at, look like gluten uh, problems. It's not gluten, though. It's the food maps causing it. So if you know this, just avoid the food map. So I'm not going to go into that in this video. It's already too long. I see it's already over 31 minutes. So I'm not going to explain that. But just do a Google search for food maps. It'll it'll give you a list of the foods that uh, contain high amounts of food maps. And if you have any problem after eating these foods, just cut them out and you'll be fine. Sodium is another one that a lot of people think is really bad for you. Uh, you know, for years people thought that sodium caused uh, a lot large amounts of sodium cause high blood pressure or hypertension a lot of people. Not really true. Uh, the people that have problems with sodium usually have a, a, a genetic uh, polymor polymorphism problem with the, what they call the renin angiotensin system. For some reason, I can't explain this seems to affect black people more than Caucasians. I don't know why. However, uh, those two people who have this really do have to be careful about sodium intake because it will raise their blood pressure. But for most people, doesn't happen. You can have as much as, I, I mean, the, I think the American Heart Association, some one of those organizations, it recommends no more than 1,500 milligrams of sodium. I, when I did research, I did a huge article, which is available in the article archives in my Applied Metabolics newsletter website. I did an extremely extensive article about the truth about sodium. And in my research, I found that uh, this is complete bull crap. In fact, 1,500 milligrams is actually detrimental to health for most people. It's too low a, 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 a amount of sodium. The actual amount for most people you can eat should be closer to 6,000 milligrams. Now, a lot of people would say I'm crazy for saying that, but check the research. You'll see that I'm right. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, people that, uh, uh, strangely enough, here are results of a large uh, observ observational study of over 100, 130,000 people suggested that people without high blood pressure should not limit their sodium intake to under 3 grams per, per day because doing so, this is shocking, will increase, increase the risk of heart disease, not decrease it, increase it. Let me say that again. If your sodium intake is too low, you will increase, not decrease, the risk of heart disease. Moving on to the next food, chocolate. I mean, uh, cho who, who doesn't like chocolate? But uh, hey, uh, but get but good news and bad news about chocolate. <clears throat> Most forms of chocolate, like the chocolate candy, chocolate's garbage. It's loaded with sugar. It's no good for you. It is bad. However, there's a form of chocolate called dark cocoa. Dark cocoa is also rich in, uh, in, uh, in polyphenols, particularly one called epicatechin, which is uh, extremely healthy. Uh, according to a 2011 study in a chemistry journal, 
uh, cocoa's flavanol content may, may provide greater antioxidant activity than some fruits, including blueberries and, and uh, is it aki, aci, A-C-A-I, I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing it, see, I'm not sure, how, but aci berries, you know, but it turns out that the cocoa provides more antioxidant activity than that. Cocoa offers potent antioxidant, antioxidant, antioxidant activity, and because of that, it helps protect your, your no uh, production in the body, nitric oxide. The, uh, by protecting no, in turn, the cho dark chocolate will increase insulin sensitivity, reduce blood pressure, and improve artery function in, a, in adults who are overweight, have high blood pressure, or both. So, again, little known fact, uh, the flavonoids in, in cocoa, like epicatechin, will actually increase your nitric oxide level, probably more efficient than taking oral arginine. The flavanols and dark chocolate also help to protect the skin against UV radiation from the sun, might even help you to uh, help to protect you against getting skin cancer to a certain extent. I wouldn't count on it alone, though. I'd still wear, a, if you're gonna, you'd be in the sun for extended times, you should still wear some sort of sunblock. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll say about uh, a dark chocolate or cocoa, if you're going to consume dark chocolate, make sure that it contains at least 70% cocoa. Otherwise, it's junk food. Don't eat it. And that's about it. Those are the foods that are, you know, often considered bad, but turns out they're not so bad after all. I think the key, uh, the key element to, to remember or to take home is that, uh, you know, all these foods in moderation are, are not only not bad for you, but are actually healthy. But, you know, these, the principle of hormesis, states that uh, things, uh, anything that's beneficial in small amounts can turn toxic when they're past a certain point. In other words, any of these things, if you start to overdo them, can actually become bad for you, like especially stuff like sodium and, and, uh, and some of the other things I mentioned, excess amounts of red meat and the, you know, the fat stuff. You know, you don't want to go crazy on that, you know, but small amounts is definitely not bad for you. If you want further information about nutrition, exercise, science, uh, hormonal therapy, ergogenic AIDS, anti-aging research you can use today, fat loss techniques that really work, uh, exercise science, did I say that already? Anyway, women's health and fitness, uh, subscribe, and many other, many other topics. Subscribe today to my Applied Metabolics newsletter, www.appliedmetabolics.com. When you subscribe, I will send you an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook page where each day I post new information on exercise, nutrition, general medicine, and health. That's only for current subscribers. I also have an email portal on my Applied Metabolics website where I'll answer short questions from current subscribers, only current subscribers, not, I don't handle, uh, uh, I don't answer uh, unsolicited questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I only have time for my subscribers. You're welcome to leave comments under these videos uh, for such as suggestions for uh, future videos. Boy, this one went really long. I apologize for that. 37. I'm looking at it, it's 37 minutes. But for those for those of you who uh, stayed here to the end, I appreciate it. But you know, what can I say? There are uh, there are some people that oh, I always get people who send me links to watch Joe Rogan's uh, podcasts, and I, when I see how long they are, I almost fall out of my chair. I mean, if you could watch a three-hour podcast, you certainly could sit through 38 minutes of, of a video. Anyway, <laughs> if you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, go to your local shelter, adopt a dog. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience.